Hello guys, welcome back. This is a pretty special video. I was actually just about to go to sleep today and all of a sudden I was reading this article on Chess24 talking about the Magnus Invitational Chess Tournament where basically all of the strongest chess players in the world gather up to play against each other online on Chess24. The time and control there was pretty quick but it was not exactly blitz, it was uh, more of a rapid time control. And basically they were all talking about that first game where Carlson played some very bad blunders in the opening and lost very quickly. But nobody was really talking about this very interesting idea that Carlson was preparing in the opening. And I think that this is a very, very practical and dangerous weapon if you play it, especially in some shorter time controls. So if you had this idea that you don't, you're not sure of what to do against some lines of the Nidor, for example, this line might be occasionally suitable for you, but as a surprising weapon, it can work out extremely well. It's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty spectacular gambit. So e4, c5, Carlson playing with the white pieces. Jan Nepomnishi playing with the black pieces. We have knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6. So far, so good. Very standard stuff so far. And here, 99.9% .9 of the games online, actually not online, all of chess games would be automatically being continued with knight c3. Very seldomly played also is the move pawn to f3. Basically moves that aim to defend the pawn on e4. But Carlson stumble like is, is is the first one to surprise his opponent, plays this move bishop to c4, basically developing a piece, keeping that pawn on e4 basically in an undefended position. And I I wanted really to call this move a novelty, and I wanted to call this all Carlson's idea. But apparently this is not strictly a novelty, it was already played a couple of times in the past, but the majority of the games that were played in this line with the move bishop c4 were mostly f with some amateur players, so b d definitely nothing very serious. And after the move bishop c4, black has this choice right now. Basically the pawn on e4 is hanging, so most players would like to just take this pawn. But let's also consider some other options. If black plays a move like e6, which is a normal move for the Sicilian defense, then white can either try to do something clever like queen e2, or at the very least he can just play the move knight to c3, going back into some kind of a uh, fisher sozen type of setup, so uh, a6, bishop e3, if you want to learn a little bit more about this line, I would recommend starting off watching some old Bobby Fischer games where he won some nice games in a spectacular fashion from this position. The move e5 wouldn't make so much sense here, because as a rule of thumb, in the Sicilian defense, when there is a bishop on c4, you don't want to go e5 in order to keep the activity of that bishop, eyeballing the square on f7. So Nepomneshi was up to the task, he took the pawn on e4, which is also the strongest move and the most principled way of continuing. And now comes the move queen to h5, a very direct move, aiming to capture the pawn on f7. A very important note is that white should not be tempted by this kind of cheap tactic of bishop takes f7, king takes f7, queen h5 check, g6, queen d5 check, e6, queen takes e4, which looks extremely nice and appealing because black lost his right to castle, but actually it turns out that black will very quickly play the move bishop g7, and he will castle by hand with moves such as rook f8 and king to g8. So the fact that the black king lost the right to castle is not too significant. And actually in the long run, I think if anything, it is black who is fighting for the advantage 
because he has the two bishops. So going back to the position after Black's move, knight takes e4, Carlson played here the correct move, queen to h5. And this is already the first point where Black can go very much wrong. The pawn actually played the correct move, which is pawn to e6. The, the move which might look very much intuitive and immediate, g6, blocking the queen from attacking the pawn on f7, is met with the simple double attack, queen to d5, and there is no way to defend both the pawn on f7 and the knight on e4, and black is losing. So this is the first small trap that black needs to avoid. So e6 is strictly the only move in this position which is reasonable. And now in this position something pretty amazing happened. Uh, Carlson was actually well prepared for this game. But during the game it was a, a quick time control. He got a little bit uh, maybe in some kind of a blackout. He forgot his whole preparation. And he went astray with the move knight takes e6, which looks very nice using that pin against the king, but actually after bishop takes e6, which was played in the game, bishop takes e6, queen to e7, it turns out pretty quickly that white is in huge troubles, since if the bishop retreats, for example, to b3, black has this standard idea of a discovered attack, the king is checked, the queen is under attack, and white cannot retreat to e2, since that would cause an immediate checkmate. And in the game itself, Carlsen basically had to give up the bishop on f7, and he basically tried to survive playing a piece down. He did lost eventually, and basically the, the, really, the really great game that we could have gotten was probably kind of postponed to another time. So let's dive into the correct variations that po probably were in Carlsen's preparation, which he just seemed to forgot. So the critical move in this position for white is the move bishop b5 check. So the idea of this move is to force black to block on d7 with one of his pieces, and then he can exploit the pin on the pawn on f7 to capture the pawn on e6. So this is the second point where black can go very wrong if he plays the obvious move. If he goes bishop to d7, which is I think what uh, most players would automatically play in a blitz time control, now white can just take on e6, exploiting this type of a double pin. So the pawn on f7 is pinned, the bishop on d7 also is pinned. And now black is in some troubles since his queen is under attack. And if, for example, he plays the move queen to b6 with the idea to control the square on c7, avoiding some forks with knight c7 check, white has this tactical motif, which we will also encounter later on, so keep that in mind. Also the pawn on f2 is under attack, so white has this nice move bishop to e3, and the idea that if black captures the bishop on d5, White has this check on c7 with a fork against the king and the queen. So this is not really working for black. So the move bishop d7 on move number 7 is already very bad for black. Let's take a look at some other options. Knight c6 is obviously very bad because white just take on c6 and uh, forks all of black pieces. So really it leaves black only with one reasonable move which is knight to d7. And now white continues with his plan of knight takes e6. Now this position is extremely sharp. And I think what was initially Carlsen's intention is to get into this position in a quick time control game, putting lots of pressure on black's position and counting on black maybe not really uh, finding the correct moves on over the board because it's extremely difficult to figure what is going on here exactly. Obviously black's queen is under attack so instinctively, instinctively you want to move it. First of all let's take a look 
what happens if black tries to play for the same trick that he played for in the game, queen to e7. This is actually a mistake in this case, because now white has this resource knight c7 check, king d8, and in this position, very very important is not to make this tempting move knight takes rook, because black once again has this tactical trick with knight g3, taking our queen. So the correct move would be knight to d5, attacking the queen on, on e7, and now after the queen moves, white can just castle his king, and the position is of equal material, but black would be in a very very bad shape because his king is stuck in the center forever. I would go as far as saying that black's position is nearly losing here. So the move queen e7 is incorrect. If black plays the move queen to b6, we have a similar motif to what we have seen in the previous variation with the bishop on d7. We have the move bishop to e3. Once again, using the fact that black cannot take on b5. Sorry, that was a, a misclick. This is, by the way, the, <laughs> the final position of the game where Carlsen uh, resigned. You see there is a rook for three pieces, so probably understandably, understandably a resignable position. So let me go back to the game position real quick. So this was the position I was talking about. And now if queen takes b5, once again, same tactic. So really, that leaves black with two choices, which are basically not losing. First one is being the move pawn to g6. And after queen e2, pawn takes e6, queen takes e4. We get this kind of position where it's not really losing for black. His pawn e6 is under attack. Black needs to make a little bit of an awkward move right now to defend it. For example, queen to e7. And after something like castles, I think white's position here is very comfortable. In the next move, he's going to finish the development of his pieces. And his plan for the long run would be to centralize both of his rooks on the central files and try to exert lots of pressure against those hanging pawns on, he6, on e6 and d6, which are slightly vulnerable since they cannot be supported by friendly pawns. So this leaves us with only one move that the engine shows very quickly, but I'm not sure how easy it would be for any player to spot such a move during a first time control game. This is the move knight to f6. The idea is to deflect the queen out of this long diagonal. So if now white's queen just moves away, black just picks up the knight on e6, so white must take the black queen. Black takes white's queen. And actually this position, in first glance, it looks like white is just losing because his knight is essentially trapped or looks like it's trapped on d8. But there are a couple of nice resources here for white. White now takes on d7, exploiting the fact that now any recapture of the bishop on d7 would let this knight an escaping route, either via f7 or via b7. So black recaptures with the bishop, knight takes on b7. In this position, white is uh, currently a pawn up, but black is very quickly going to regain it, bishop to c6. Very important, by the way, that if black tries to trap our knight with the move a5, trying to control that escaping square, we have this move bishop to d2, attacking the pawn on a5 and renewing the idea of retreating with the knight. So the move pawn to a5 doesn't really make sense. So bishop c6, the knight is under attack, he must retreat to a5. Bishop takes g2, black is regaining his lost pawn, rook to g1. Bishop to e4 is pretty much forced. All of this variation, by the way, is, is very, very forcing, surprisingly. And in this position, our pawn on c2 is under attack, but actually the strongest thing that we can do right now is just to sacrifice this pawn for a quick development and playing for the initiative. I really like the move knight c3 here. And after the move, bishop takes c2, bishop to e3. White is planning on the next move to play the move rook to c1, gaining one more tempo against the black bishop. And this position is objectively 
uh, about equal. Like if you would put this position into an engine, it would tell you that objectively the position is okay for both sides. But I think over the board, it's much easier and much nicer to play with the white pieces because it's always easier to play when you have this, you know, very easy flowing initiative and uh, developing moves. So one example, Revariation, which is not forced already, but very logical. If Lech try, tries to finish the development of his pieces, let's say go bishop to e7, white goes rook to c1, bishop to g6, and now white can play the move knight to d5, attacking both the bishop on e7 and threatening the knight on c7. White has a pretty serious initiative here, and black needs to be careful in order to not to get into troubles in this position. So I think in the future we are expected to see a couple of more games being played with this line. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this uh, uh, lecture about the surprising new idea in the opening with bishop c4. So I really expect that in the future we are going to see a little bit more of this. It's really a very rare case where you see already at move number 5 in such a main line variation like the Sicilian, uh, this kind of new ideas pumping up. Just it shows us how infinite is the game of chess and how you can find new ideas and new weapons in the opening and you know it's just a matter of how creative you are and how much you are willing to take some risks. So hope you guys I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to see some more analysis, more in-depth analysis of this game, I will link a link in the description to the study board I created on Leeches, which would be a public study for anybody to watch. And uh, with this, I'm going to wrap up this video. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like button. Actually, smash the like button on, on this video just to help this uh, channel to be uh, promoted for the YouTube algorithm. This would be hugely appreciated and I'll see you guys in the next videos. Bye bye guys.